Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This episode is called The Flying Phoenix. It was written by Stuff national correspondent Tony Wall. Regular Long Read listeners may remember Tony. He's featured here before. He usually records out of our Auckland studio, which sadly is off limits at the moment. But he joins me now by phone. Hey, Tony. Hi. The Flying Phoenix. That could be a lot of things. Uh, Give us the elevator pitch. What's this story about? Well, there's this mysterious building uh, or complex, you might say, uh, in the middle of nowhere, near Waihi in a Coromandel there, Um, and it's this huge, huge compound of uh, seven buildings, um, uh, sort of brand new build. Somebody's told me about it and said, you've got to check it out. It's incredible. It's, uh, and especially inside, it's got like Italian marble floors and walls and it's just top of the range um, fit out. And nobody seems to know what it's for or who built it. That's sort of the appeal here. Like it's sort of hiding in plain sight in a way. What do what do people know about it? Is it is it a known thing among the locals? Well, some locals know about it because they may have been there. They they have held a, a vegetarian festival there once a year, um, so some people may have been to that. Local schools in the area, some of them have um, had some cultural days there, um, and the odd school camp. But I think generally most people don't really know it's there. It really is tucked away in this valley called Golden Valley. I, I you know, I just really wanted to find out what it is, what it's for, and who's behind it. Yeah. So this is sort of a quest narrative. You're on the hunt, trying to find out the answers to these questions. Was it hard to find the information? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. I I wanted to sort of go on a bit of a quest to to find out. And and, um, on the face of it, it's um, pretty straight up. You know, they're Taiwanese New Zealanders who've built this $50 million learning centre in the middle of nowhere. But I wanted to go a little deeper than that. You know, are they part of some kind of religious organisation? Um some kind of organised thing or are they just, you know, good-minded citizens who want to do good for the for the country? And, um, yeah, it was a little bit difficult to try and find out. They didn't really want to say. Thanks, Tony. Let's get into it. Here's me reading Tony's story, The Flying Phoenix. A religious cult. A Taiwanese government bolt hole. A nudist colony. No theory is too outlandish for Waihi locals wondering what's going on behind a formidable set of security gates on rural Landlist Road. A sign about 10 kilometres out of Waihi, on the road to Whangamata, points the way to something called the Waihi Academy, nestled in a bucolic farming community known as Golden Valley. Venture past an unmanned security booth, up a sweeping driveway, and you're greeted by a remarkable sight. A sprawling campus featuring seven palatial buildings with sandstone pillars, grand balconies, domes and arches, set on 10 hectares of perfectly manicured grounds. There's an administration block, four classrooms, two dormitories, each sleeping 120 people, Staff accommodation, a commercial-sized kitchen and dining area, and, topping it all off, a 600-capacity grand hall. Inside is no less impressive. Italian marble floors, Asian hardwood doors, floors and furniture, cedar entrance canopies, and imported stonework. It's got to be the grandest property in the Hodaki district, maybe even Waikato the kind of thing you'd expect to see in a big city. Of course, none of it came cheap. Construction started around 2006, and by the time it was finished, seven years later, the bill was almost $50 million. So, who's behind it? And where did the money come from? That's not so easy to find out. The Waihi Academy has a website which says it hires out the facility for school camps, conferences 
and retreats. Its vision, it says, is to promote peace and harmony through multicultural interactive learning experiences that enhance personal and spiritual growth that respects the true essence of all living things. A Buddhist organization, perhaps? Stuff visited the campus and met the program director, Tony Kang, and his assistant, Jasmine Liu, both Taiwanese New Zealanders. Kang explains that the land and buildings are owned by an entity called the Flying Phoenix Trust. He only leases part of the site for the school camps, conferences and retreats. Until COVID hit, he was working with high schools in the area to bring in students from Taiwan and Singapore. They'd spend a week at the academy having an OE-type experience, then head to the partner school for tuition. Since the border closed, he's been hosting the occasional school camp. Hamilton's Sacred Heart Girls College has stayed and Tauranga's Aquinas College is booked for October, as well as retreats for groups such as Baha'i followers. Anyone is welcome to hire the place, Kang says, but the trust has four strict rules. Vegetarian food only, no alcohol or cigarettes, separation of the sexes in the dormitories, and the right to refuse entry to the wrong type of people. If they want to come with a little bit uh, crazy party, I don't think we'll accept that, Kang says, laughing. He admits the rules have made it hard to attract customers, and the business has struggled to make money, but the trust doesn't charge much rent, and it takes care of rates and maintenance. The trust doesn't owe any people money, Kang says. They don't need to worry about someone taking the property, mortgage or something. Flying Phoenix is not a religious group, he says. Their philosophy, their principle, is they are all vegetarian. They want to promote harmony, he says. In Chinese culture, the mythical phoenix, or Feng Huang, is a symbol of virtue and grace. Jasmine Liu, Kang's assistant, adds that the owners are concerned about global warming and want to protect the earth. They're like Greenpeace. Neither Kang nor Liu will give a contact name or number for anyone from the trust, saying they avoid publicity. The land the academy sits on, and several other farms on Landless Road, including a kiwifruit orchard and lavender farm, are owned by a company called Tatung Limited. Tatung is a district in Taipei, the Taiwanese capital. There is no trust called Flying Phoenix listed on the charity's register, but there is a limited liability company of that name with some of the same directors and shareholders as Tatung mostly Auckland-based Taiwanese. According to property records, the main chunk of land was purchased in 1998. In 2002, resource consent was granted to develop land previously used for farming into, quote, a learning and cultural centre for Taiwanese and New Zealand students. No more than 320 students could stay there at once. A report by a joint Hauraki District Council-Waikato Regional Council hearing committee shows some locals were suspicious of the project from the start. Neighbouring farmers were opposed. One submitted that the proposal was a totally inappropriate use of rural land that would change the environment in this locality forever. The neighbour was concerned that the real purpose of the centre may be different to what was stated in the application a fear expressed by other submitters too. Local iwi also opposed the resource consent, concerned about the impact of stormwater and sewage discharge, earthworks and oil spillage on areas of significance to Māori, and a lack of consultation in line with treaty principles. But council staff recommended consent be given, as any adverse effects of the development could be mitigated and it would be a major asset for the community. Consent came with a lengthy set of environmental conditions. The developer was required to plant trees to screen the buildings from the road, 
and the colour scheme had to achieve a softening and blending of the buildings into the landscape. There was little media coverage of the development, other than a spate of stories in 2010 when an open day was put on for councillors and journalists. At the time, Flying Phoenix trustee Bernard Jan explained that having the academy in a remote area would allow students from overseas to study in an environment where they would not succumb to the temptations of city life or become victims of crime. Finance was raised from investors in Taiwan who offered low-interest loans, he explained. Tony Kang says Jan is no longer involved with the trust. John Tregida, a former Hodaki mayor, says it was never quite established why the group wanted to build such a complex in rural Waikato. The Phoenix Trust has obviously got a significant amount of money behind it, he says. They've purchased just about all of the land and neighbouring farms all the way to the sea. People were excited we were going to have this big investment. It was going to employ a lot of people. But Tregida says while some overseas students came, the school never really took off. It was getting used, but for a $50 million investment, you would expect that, as a business proposition, it would have to turn a lot of people over. I don't believe that it was ever intended to be a profit-driven complex. Tregida says he met people associated with the trust on a trip to Taiwan but never got to the bottom of whether they were part of some organisation or religion. There's a huge amount of rumours and a lot of speculation, he says. Even in Taiwan, I tried to get exactly what was happening. To be truthful, I don't know. I did meet one or two gentlemen in Taiwan who were supporting the process and the programme. They seemed like normal businessmen to me. They were short, brief meetings. We didn't get into detail. Tregida wondered whether there was some tax advantage for the investors. I've asked the question. I haven't had an answer. He says he worked hard to help the trust gain community support. And to its credit, it put on open days, which were successful. We were expecting a lot of people coming from overseas, and it was going to be good for the community. That hasn't delivered. I'm hugely disappointed that such an amazing complex hasn't had the use. The potential is unbelievable. It was a hell of a slog, but you've made it. You've bought your first home. Congratulations. Now what? If you're feeling nervous about doing DIY on your biggest investment yet, or you're struggling to think of ways to add value to your new home, then join me, Joe Davis, and me, Kylie Klein Nixon, for First Rung Reno 101, a stuff homed podcast about owning and doing up your own home. Brought to you with support from Resine. Strap on your tool belt and find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you find good podcasts. Construction of the complex was hampered by delays, cost overruns, and a dispute with the contractor, Macmillan and Lockwood. Carsten Nopper was project manager of the first stage, which cost about $33 million. He says it was a challenging job because of language barriers and the fact that it was never clear who was in charge. It took all the time we were there building it to actually figure out what the relations are between these people or what their background is, says Nopper who has since left Macmillan and Lockwood and set up his own firm. It was always left a little bit in the mystery side of things. Who was really in charge and making the decisions? It was always told to us, we have to go back to the board. All I know is there was a board in New Zealand and there was a board in Taiwan, and they reported backwards and forwards. Sometimes it took months to get a simple yes or no. They were more concerned about the ducks that were swimming in the puddles on the site. What are we going to do with them? They love animals. Nopper says he was proud of the project, but was left with a sour taste when the trust withheld a payment, accusing the firm of overcharging. 
they said we basically ripped them off and we had to go through an arbitration process. The outcome was, no, we didn't. Everything was legit and documented and there in writing. Trust representatives he dealt with were suspicious of China, Nopper says, even asking him to alert them if any Chinese people came to the site. The funny thing is, Nopper says, one of the first school groups I know of who came to the Waihi Academy once it was finished was a busload of Chinese students from Auckland. I think they changed their mind when they saw somebody's interested in paying money. Nopper says the Taiwanese would gather at one of the farmhouses they owned to pray. He thought they were Christian. He encouraged them to be more open with the community and share their plans to stop people speculating. I kept telling these guys, if you don't open yourself up to the community down the road, what do you think you're going to achieve here? You're on their doorstep, and they know virtually nothing about it. Although they made the site available for cultural days and events such as a vegetarian festival, they mostly hid away, Nopper says. Everything is absolutely pristine and the best of the best, but then it's not used. So everybody's scratching their heads for years and thinking, why did they do this? Did they just want to have a retreat place that if China invades Taiwan, they can get on a plane and come down here? No one really knows why it hasn't taken off the way it was supposed to. Macmillan and Lockwood and the Trust agreed to part ways after their dispute, and a new architect and contractor were brought in to complete the development. Kang, a machine engineer and project manager in Taiwan before he moved to New Zealand in 1991 and became a property developer, was brought in as project coordinator. There was building material everywhere, he says. It was very unorganised and really rough. The trust were very frustrated. They don't know how to carry on. Kang appointed a project manager and a head foreman and says he managed to come in significantly under the $18 million budget he was given. The complex was finally finished in 2013. Despite having no background in education, the trust asked Kang to run the academy. He advised that running it as a school wouldn't work. Asian parents are looking for schools with strong academic backgrounds and old boys and girls networks, Kang says, which the academy doesn't have. He says he told the owners, I guarantee you won't get a profit from the education. Really difficult. Instead, he suggested working with local high schools to promote the academy as a place foreign students could use while studying at their school. Starting in 2014, he teamed up with six colleges, taking some principals to Taiwan to visit schools there looking for recruits. Kang says in the first year, about 40 students came out. By the time COVID-19 shut the operation down, On average, 100 students were coming twice a year during Northern Hemisphere summer and winter holidays. Parents would pay about $6,000 for four weeks of tuition, including airfares. The money was paid to the individual school, and the academy would invoice the school for its services. Ross Priest former principal of Whangamata Area School, worked closely with Kang to promote the concept, travelling to Taiwan a couple of times with Kang and his wife. His school paid for his airfares, while Kang covered accommodation and expenses, Priest says. We only got one or two students, but that's all right. We were really forming a relationship with them, and it was around their facilities. From our point of view, We only needed one student to pay for my share of the expense. Priest describes the academy as a fascinating place. It was almost on the field of dreams, you know. Build it and they will come. I said to Kang, 50 million is a lot of money. And he said, if we're here for 300 years, and we plan to be here for that long, then 50 million is not a lot of money. 
the Academy made an effort to reach out to the community, Priest says, putting on cultural days for Year 7 and 8 students and connecting Whangamata Area School with a calligraphy master. Calligraphy became part of its Year 6 curriculum. Priest was a little suspicious of them to start, but I had a relationship with them for four years, and in that time, they didn't have any hidden agendas they were trying to promulgate. They just believe in doing good works. When they built it, they'd have a real drive. Then they'd run out of money, and they'd pass around the hat, and another $5 million would turn up. It's all donated money, either from Taiwan or around the world, or members in New Zealand. Priest wasn't sure of the group's beliefs, but thought it was similar to Confucianism. A woman renting one of the five farmhouses on Landlist Road owned by the Flying Phoenix Trust finally sheds light on their philosophy. They are followers of the Tao, which means the way, she says, asking to remain anonymous. They follow Lao Tzu, who brought up novel ideas around ethics and how to live a meaningful life centuries ago. Taoism holds that humans and animals should live in balance with the Tao, or the universe, according to National Geographic. Followers believe in spiritual immortality, where the spirit joins the universe after death. Initially, the academy was set up by donations from people who wanted to bring this philosophy to other parts of the world, the tenant says. It's a beautiful, ethical way of living. I know them. They're really nice people. They do a lot of good work. They do things like give free Tai Chi lessons. The tenant says the trust is nervous about publicity in case its beliefs are misconstrued. Much of what we read in the press is inflammatory. They're worried people will write in the wrong way. Stuff makes contact with the only Flying Phoenix trustee who lives locally, Chi Mao Lin, known as George, who was also a director of Tatong, which he says acts as a trustee company for Flying Phoenix. Are they Taoists? Many people from Taiwan, we believe Taoism, he says. Buddhism, that's part of our life. He won't comment further without permission from the board and asks that questions be emailed. An Auckland lawyer called Fui Lung Chan of Lu and Ku Barristers and Solicitors gets in touch. The trust is concerned that our questions are intrusive, he says. Any suggestion the organisation is shrouded in secrecy, as previous articles stated, is not a good slant. Eventually, Lynn provides a brief written response. The trust board is made up of local persons who either have a permanent resident visa or hold a New Zealand passport, he says. The aim of the facility is to foster the exchange of studies of language, culture, healthcare and cultural technology to promote ethics, mutual assistance and harmony, and to seek to establish and maintain a positive working relationship with the people of Waihi. The Trust's funding comes from investor loans, he says, and income from its investment properties, including houses rented to locals, the kiwifruit orchard, and land leased for grazing and crops. Further to the philosophies of the Trust, we believe eating vegetarian food can help achieve environmental protection goals by assisting in energy conservation and carbon reduction, which we believe is in line with the global environmental trend. Travis Coffey, who was project manager on the second stage of the development, says because the community didn't accept them at first, the group went into its shell. But as they opened up for things like the vegetarian festival and cultural days, that changed. I'm your typical meat-eating Kiwi guy, Coffee says, but being introduced to their way of life, the vegetarian food, we were really looked after. 
and I have nothing but the highest regard and respect for them. They're a spiritual group. There's no organization or cult or anything. That was The Flying Phoenix on The Long Read from Stuff, written by Tony Wall and read and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was mixed by Sam Scannell. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listened via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on The Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.